Yeah, when I was a little boy sitting on my mind. Hello, welcome to Going Deeper. I'm very happy today because a familiar face here at Amherst Media, Isaac Ben Ezra, will cross to the other side of the table and be my guest. And this is a two-part interview. Isaac has had his own show here called Conversations, and he's going into his 18th year of production. He's brought a wealth of coverage to us here about many current issues and people and institutions over the years. But today, the focus will be on Isaac and his long life of meaningful work. So Isaac was born in 1926. He grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And that was a particular time, a particular slice of American immigrant history. And we're going to hear more about that in the interview. Isaac has had a lifelong involvement with political movements, working as a community organizer, an educator, and a social worker, and a mediator. Some of the movements he's been involved in include the Civil Rights Movement, the Anti-War Movement, the Campaign for Medicare in 1964, the Labor Movement, Stop Foreclosures Movement, and most recently, here in Amherst, several things related to medical care, prescriptions, which we'll talk about, ending smoking in restaurants, and uh, he was very instrumental in helping 25 nurses uh, keep their jobs at Cooley Dickinson. And that's just to name a few. So uh, I want to get started. Thanks for joining me today, Isaac. Thanks for, for having me. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to start at the beginning and hear a little bit about your childhood. And I want to especially hear about what it was like on the Lower East Side during the late 20s, early, you know, into the 30s. And um, how those years and what you experienced in your family and in the institutions around you, what in those years informed your work for social justice later on in life? Well, from 26, to let's say World War II, 41. That's, that was my growing up period. Uh, there were 17 million unemployed in America. Uh, my family was one of the 17 million. Mm. So we experienced what was called home relief in those days. We lived in a cold water flat. If you go down to New York City, lower in the Lower East Side, there's a museum now showing oh. what what a flat, what a settle, what a flat looks like. The Tenement Museum. The Tenement Museum. Mm -hmm. I've heard of it. Uh, uh, there's no heat. Uh, illness was prevalent amongst uh, a population where the children were living in families that were not nourished mm -hmm. and unemployed. Uh, some of us got to go away uh, to, to foster care. Some of us got to go to institutions because families couldn't take care of mm -hmm. their children during that period. Wow. And so there were bread lines. There were all kinds of experiences relating to what it's like to be unemployed in mm. America today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning. Yeah. And those years, how old were you when you were in foster care? I was about uh, three years old. Yeah, yeah. But still, you kept ties with your parents and ended up moving back with them, well, right? Well, my, my mother came once, I remember, for a visit. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was excruciatingly painful. Yeah. But, uh, but then I was reunited about six months later. Uh-huh. And during those years, there were these institutions, the settlement houses. and. I did. I just looked that up a little bit to find out about that. That was quite a significant role in that area, right? Well, the, the settlement houses were a place which was primarily for first generation and immig immigrant families, okay. where they learn, elders learned English. Okay. There were uh, classes. 
uh, art classes, there were, there were libraries, uh, there were activities for young people. It's no, generally known as the Settlement House Movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there were a number of them on the Lower East Side. And that was a, a good thing in your life, right? That was, that's something that I participated in after I came home from a year and a half in a, uh, a hospitalization period that I mm -hmm. spent mm -hmm. uh, time in. I'll talk about that later. That was um, the Ro rheumatic Irving, fever? Yeah, I, have, I was diagnosed with rheumatic fever when mm -hmm. I was about eight years old. And at 11, I was on a list, and at 11, I got to go to a place called Irvington House on the Hudson hmm. for children with heart conditions and rheumatic fever. And that was probably the, the, the best mm. time in my uh, wow. young life. I, we, we were in a town called Irvington on the Hudson. And I got to look down and see what a tree looked like. Yeah. And the, the Hudson River flow, with the floating boats going by. Hmm. It was a wonderful, and it was a respite. Sure. It was a chance to get away from what was a, a difficult time. I know that one of the things we want to kind of focus on during the interview is making some reflections between the history then and how things are going now, and you know what what is what is life like now? And I I just like to ask you a little bit about the Great Depression and those years that you experienced so much poverty, and how you see today and and what's going on with unemployment and poverty today. Well, I have to say that uh, those early uh, lifetime experiences. Uh, shaped ultimately what I was going to do in my life. Mm -hmm. So I have always been associated with working with people who were unemployed, underemployed, uh, victims of our great society, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and opening up opportunities and dealing with how to make life better. The, the social movements, that the, the fight for Medicare, as an yeah. example of that. Yeah. When I was growing up, there was no Medicare. Social Security just started mm -hmm. in '36, so I was 10 years old at that time. There was no Social Security for my family. Yeah, yeah. So I have seen the changes and have been a party yes, you have. to those changes because I could see they made an impact on decreasing the, the level of poverty. Yeah. It also seemed like there was a different quality of, uh, a different tone with how poor people were viewed then and how they are now. Um, you know, the, the idea being that back then a person was down on their luck, experiencing hard times, and now there's this sort of blaming the victim that they're poor because they don't want to work or they're lazy or they, you know, somehow not understanding the bigger picture and, and the sort of societal problems that are causing the, pro the, the poverty. I think you have the cart before the horse historically. Things were much worse in terms of attitudes. There was this movement of people on the dole were unworthy. Oh, they, okay. So there was no easy ride, and there's never been an easy ride right. for people who were in need of help. Right. Uh, what's different now is we have more programs, mm -hmm. and that was because of the struggles of people in that. The immigrant movement was huge. The labor movement yeah. was growing. We had 17 million Americans uh, who, were, who lost their farms and lost their jobs, yeah. and, and so we... It was a, a, a terrible period, but it was also a time for great experimentation. Those of you who watched the FDR days recently on PBS have some kind of an inkling of what it was like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the, the labor movement. You were uh, the shop steward uh, for Warehouse Workers Union, and then you were also in the Steel Workers Union. So what, what was the, what, what can you tell us about the labor movement and that some of the actions that you were involved in? Well, what I can say is for me, there was no graduating high school going on to college. Right. That was not uh, in, in comp my compass of possibilities. 
at that time because basically the teenage years were a year of struggle mm -hmm. uh, of tr having older parents uh, who couldn't support their children, having, having to deal with the welfare system. And this created a, a cloud on young people. I was fully aware at the age of six that somehow I was different when my mother would give me food stamps to take down to the grocery. I would wait until there was nobody in the grocery hmm. and then I would present my food wow. stamps and bring back a quart of milk or whatever I was buying. What? Uh, uh, that, 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 so that whole environment of growing up was made more difficult because it wasn't the, the TV family. Right. A, a house, kids mm -hmm. uh, going to activities, parents fighting with each other about silly things. They were fighting about real things. Sure, sure. And, uh, and of course it was a time when uh, the family was broken up uh, during that period. I was the youngest of the Mohegans. I, I used to say I'm the youngest of the Mohegans. Uh, my next in line was my brother Leon, who was eight years older. Okay. Then a brother, a sister who was ten years older. Hmm. Then a, and then two brothers following that. Wow. So that they were out of the house by the time I became a young adult. So I, in many ways, I was the only child in home with two aging parents. Right. With multiple issues. Wow. It's a, it's remarkable how you came through all of that in such a beautiful way. Well, know? I paid a big price. I, uh -huh. I know what depression is. Uh, I, know, I know how to survive depression. Mm -hmm. I've had, that, had to survive or I wouldn't be here. But at the same time, I also, uh, the, the Lower East Side was a place that, that was my real education, growing up on the Lower East Side. Yeah. The, the, the progressive movement was alive and well then. The trade union movement was alive and well. And I learned that there were reasons for, for right. uh, people being poor and, and that distribution of, and the equity in our system right. was not equal. And it was getting into that period of my teenage where I learned that I, I wasn't the problem. The problem was the system that wasn't servicing the needs. And so I, I was not beating myself yeah. And feeling uh, that, as a matter of fact, I loved kicking ass from the very beginning. Yeah. As soon as I discovered that, hey, this is not a fair game. Now, see, that's what I'm talking about, about the difference between then and now. That you, as a person experiencing poverty, living in it, living in the trenches of it, you didn't take it personally that there was something wrong with you. Oh, I did take it personally. No, but I mean I, personally, but not that there was something wrong with you, that there was something wrong with the system. Well, the, right? the message was there was something wrong with us because we were poor. Okay. And, and overcoming that became possible because I lived at a time when there was a progressive movement and a trade union movement right. that fought for dignity in the workplace. Right and dignity in the community. And when I realized that we had some control over our lives, then I, I look for those connections yeah. to find a way and also created my own philosophy, right. which was, which side are you on? The, you know, yeah. the famous union song. Right. Which I, and it didn't take me long to figure it out that there, were, there, were, there are two sides to that coin. Wow, yeah. So, what was it like in the, what were some of the experiences in the labor movement, you know, that a, a story or so? Well, that, I, when I was in District 65, well, Wholesale Workers Union, Okay. Uh, there was a lockout of workers, one of the big shops uh, in, in, around 10th Street and University Place in New York. And uh, we were asked to, the stewards and others from the other locals, and other shops were asked to help support those workers who were locked out. Well, that was the first time I discovered when the, when the police came, they, they didn't come to make peace. Mm. They, came make, they came to make trouble. Wow. They broke up the lines in order to allow the scabs to, and then they, there, was, there was the vice president of the union, a guy named Robinson, who was a black 
union leader, uh, was taken into the side room of one of those buildings and they really worked him out. Wow. So th that was my introduction to uh, how the government has some kind of a role in the dispute between labor and management. Right. Okay, and in these days, the labor movement is pretty diminished, right? In, in current in days. Relatively, now. absolutely. It does not And happen. I hear story after story about people who work full time even, forty hours a week, and can't bring home enough money in their in their you know, that their wages are so low that they can't really support their families. Do you think that's because the labor movement oh, has Oh absolutely. Diminished? The labor movement was a significant other in the relationship between management and labor as it was spelled out in the politics of our times. Yeah. As long as you had a strong labor movement, you had uh, support for education, you had support for health care, wow. you had support for Medicare, you had support for uh, uh, ending the uh, discrimination. Hmm. Uh, the, we, the labor movement was a significant part of the civil rights movement. Sure. Because it was con connected with not only housing but also jobs and communities, and when that started to break down, yeah, you, what you saw was a stalemate in terms of job uh, salaries. As a matter of fact, since the '70s, Mer American workers have gone back tremendously. That's why you have two people working two, three jobs right. today, which then creates its its own sort of societal changes Well, both parents... If employers can get away with hiring part-timers. Sure. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest dangers and threats to full-time jobs today is the increase in the part-time. Sure. So they don't have to pay benefits. They, uh, that, look, we have a situation right now in, uh, with our libraries. We've got a handful of hard-working people who are part-timers who are now saying, you know, it's time for us to have some benefits. Right. And I think that uh, if, if I want to say anything today is to pay attention to these members of our community. Sure. We, if, if we're getting along financially as a community on the backs of the lowest paid workers, mm -hmm. we need to take some responsibility. Absolutely. It should be part of our budget. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, Isaac, I don't know how much time we have in this segment, but you handed this to me the other day, and uh, we're going to show it on the screen. But this is um, moving into the civil rights movement now. I wanted you to read the first three paragraphs, and which tell the story of this photo. And I, I just found it so moving. I, I'd love you to share that. All right. So the, it the, starts right here. This, this, you can, this, the, this is an article in the Bucks County Courier Times and it was a celebration of, uh, of uh, the Selma, Alabama struggle. And we revisited that. And, this, and they, they have, from my time in Selma, they have the following. In 65, 1965, a Levittown resident bought, bought a wreath and card in Bristol, signed it from the people of Bucks County, then gave it to Martin Luther King in Selma. Carried, uh, King carried that wreath with him at the front of the, of the famed march. And there's a picture front, for, yeah, front we're page show picture that. of the wreath with Martin and uh, Ruther and, and, and Abernathy and Young and other people that I remember. Sure. Uh, five of us from the Levittown area went to Selma. It was our response to the explosion that happened after a black family moved in in 1957 in Levittown, Pennsylvania. We were an all-white delegation on that, on that particular march. That's the delegation from Bucks County. It was very much an integrated march in Selma, sure. which was one of several held in Selma. In the first march, the people were dogged to death, and they turned the water hoses on them. On the day of our departure, I thought it would be a good idea if we could bring something symbolic from concerned Bucks County citizens. We wanted to bring a message, so I bought a wreath at Bristol. It was a beautiful black wreath with artificial flowers. It cost me seven bucks. 
Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then he goes on to say, I wrote on the card that it was from the people of Bucks County to the people of Selma. It looked terrific. After the meeting at the church in Selma, this, the staging point for what was to be the march, I brought the wreath to one of the organizers. He said, why don't you give it to Martin? Meaning Martin Luther King. The next thing I knew, I was handing it to Martin and he was carrying it at the start of the march. It was beautiful. So Isaac wrote this article for the Bucks County Courier Times in 1998. And uh, we're gonna show the photo of uh, Martin holding the wreath that Isaac had, had bought for $7. Wow, I just was so moved by that story. Um, quite something. And the ways that you did your community organizing, always including people, always being a little original, having a little bit of a, you know, an unusual way of showing up so that there was attention to your delegation. You know, that, that was beautiful. Here's another example of, of you being creative. This was uh, 1991, I think, 1990. Um, Isaac is uh, uh, protesting the, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, and he showed up dressed as an Arab, and we're going to try and show this one as well um, to make that a was point. Part, and, uh, the band, the Bucks Alliance for, for Nuclear Disarmament. Okay. The, we, poll, we, we were at all of the polls in Bucks County in and, and bringing this, asking the, the, the voters, voters, how do you feel about going to war? And we had, we had Republicans, Democrats, the signatures were by the thousands. So yeah, uh, we have a lot, there's a lot of art creativity yeah. in, in, in some of the work that we were doing because it's not just another story. Uh, it, it, you gotta have a, Exactly. A, 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 something that's going to grab the, the, the press. Right. And There's when strategy there. I showed up there. in a looking, dressed as a, uh, somebody from the Arab world, this Jewish boy, uh, it caught the attention of the press, and that's how why we got a front page story. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's. Same thing with the, I had no idea with, when we were going to Selma that uh, the wreath would wind up in uh, Martin Luther King's hands. Yeah. So it's, it's a kind of a, and I knew the people uh, in that front page, uh, Andrew Young and Walter Ruth. I didn't know them personally. Right. But they were there, and the, so I remember their faces, and I remember them being at the front of the march. And that was a demonstration of labor people, community people, uh, all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. uh, the religious movement was very big, and it was a, a great time of where people began to stand up and support support what the the young black and some white uh, young people that went that started the march, uh, the freedom marches, the freedom buses. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's one more article that I was really um, very moved by. And this was, let's see, in 1983, uh, back when there was a big foreclosure situation happening, when unemployed homeowners were losing their houses. And um, this is an article of someone, Dave Chandler, of the Courier Times, but he quotes Isaac quite a bit here. So, Isaac is quoted, there's a cancer looming over the families in Bucks County. This cancer is the threat that many unemployed people may lose their homes because of an inability to meet the mortgage payments. These are the words of Isaac Ben Ezra. Um, Fortunately, Ben Ezra says, there's a, a cure for this cancer in the form of state legislation that would provide loans to these unemployed people so they would be able to keep their homes. Unfortunately, he adds, this legislation is currently going nowhere. And at the end of uh, the article, uh, 
it says, you know, there's different suggestions and all, but whatever type of funding is decided upon by the state lawmakers, Ben Ezra said, the legislation is needed soon. We can't, we're talking about fighting a cancer that can be eliminated. So making that connection between something that is so really emotionally, you know, heart-wrenching for people, cancer, and who everyone is trying to find a cure from, you know, for that, to connect that with the legislatures really having the ability to cure this problem of the foreclosures by just, you know, giving some money toward it. It was a beautiful way to really impose on them the pressure to get something done. Well, the, the, big, the biggest part of this story is that this happened over a period of, of several years. Uh, and we organized the first shelter in the county where we put families into facilities that we were able to rent temporarily. And in the years that we went to court, every time there was a foreclosure, we were able to get the judges to do a, a, a hold on the foreclosures hmm. to the point where we were saving hundreds of homes over the year. Wow. And finally, the, the funding was found and as of this time, over 25,000 families wow. were, the, were the recipients of that funding. That, so they, it was cheaper to fund keeping people in their home. I mean, exactly. you don't have to be a rocket scientist no. to figure out. It was cheaper to find the money to keep people in their homes and give them, put the, the, the loan on the end of the mortgage. Right. So they have five more years to pay, but at least during this period, they have a house to live in. Right. And so I think we showed the way, and it hasn't been done anywhere else. Yeah. I talked wow. to Stan Rosenberg a couple of years ago about the, 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 this whole concept, and, and, and it seems to me it's still valid. Oh, yeah. We ought to have an insurance policy to keep when the, when the, when the, when the, the, the society, when, when our, when our, when Wall Street brings us into another crisis, we ought to protect the, the families Absolutely. and not just bail out the, the banks. Okay. So Isaac, we're going to continue this great, you know, wealth of information from your life, but we have to close this part one. And I want to thank you all for coming and being with us, and we'll see you in part two. Okay, thanks.